Hello and welcome everyone. My name is uh, Katarina Pak and I work as a training manager um, with the Refugee Sponsorship Training Program and I'll let my colleague Serena introduce herself. Hi, thank you so much Katarina. My name is Serena Richardson and I am the online course coordinator for the Refugee Sponsorship Training Program. All right. There is a lot of information to share as we take you on a walk through demonstrations for how to use the permanent residence portal for private sponge publications. I will say that we will be using a lot of acronyms today. So the digital portal, we will also be referring to it as PR portal. It's the permanent residency applications portal. We will also be providing micro learning video clips on our YouTube channel for some of the basic steps that you may want to refer back to without having to preview the lengthier training session recording. And uh, we will also be providing you with the handouts, um, which has some in additional information that we will briefly mention, but not be going into detail about today. In this handout, you will find a list of terms and definitions as it relates to the online portal. A chart of the uh, portal user roles and permissions, and um, there is also there will be a copy of the information on how to determine who should be the primary sponsor, um, which you would have learned about in the previous information session on the digital portal that we uh, delivered a few weeks ago. If you did not participate in that webinar, it's not a problem. You can find the recorded video on your YouTube channel under the playlist for the PR portal. Since we are meeting today on a virtual platform, I would like to begin by acknowledging that each of us here today are located in various places across this nation we call Canada, and we are each residing on the traditional territory of many First Nations peoples. Uh, I would like to specifically acknowledge that Toronto, uh, the location of uh, the RSTP's main office, is situated on the lands of many First Nation peoples, including Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt and Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, we invite you to personally dedicate time to learn about, reflect on and acknowledge the history and lands of the First Nations peoples where you reside and to personally consider how we can each in our own way move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, a few words about our program, Refugee Sponsorship Training Program. In case we have participants on the line today who um, haven't, um, haven't uh, worked with us before, haven't uh, uh, contacted us for our services, so just to let you know what, what, um, what our program does, what kind of services we offer. So we are a national program and um, we, except for the province of Quebec, um, we don't provide training for the province of Quebec sponsors uh, because Quebec has its own immigration system and um, its own refugee sponsorship program. Um, RSTP, we are a program designed to support groups of five and community sponsors, uh, sponsor agreement holders, um, and their constituent groups and co-sponsors in Canada. We are funded by the Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, and uh, we are administered by Catholic Cross-Cultural Services, which is a newcomer serving agency located in Toronto. We have a team of trainers um, who are located across Canada, and you can visit our website to find a trainer um, near you. This is our website, rstp.ca, and you can find um, a list of our team members in different locations um, under the Contact Us um, page. So what do we do? We provide information, training, and resources for all aspects of the private sponsorship process um, to sponsors and uh, to the general public who are interested in the private refugee sponsorship program. And we do this by communicating updates and information uh, sent by Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada via our website, um, rstp.ca, and through two newsletters um, that, um, uh, that, uh, that we uh, share with sponsors. 
Um, we also respond to many emails and phone calls uh, for inquiries about Private Refugee Sponsor Program. Um, and we do have our own helpline. Uh, you see the phone number right now on your screens. Um, it's a toll-free number and it is monitored by our team members during the working hours. So it's a great way to get instant answers to your sponsorship questions. So it's 1-877-290-1701. Uh, we also have a variety of online resources on our website, such as fact sheets, uh, best practices manual, minimum financial support calculator, um, and also videos of the past training sessions. And you can follow us on the social media. We have, uh, we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube accounts. Um, we also have a variety of other services, such as online um, tra e training courses. So these are longer training programs um, for, uh, for those who would like to expand their knowledge on the PSR program itself. Um, we offer in-person training and workshops on a variety of topics related to the private sponsorship of refugees. So you, if, you, if you'd like to know if there is a workshop in your area, please contact your local RSTP trainer. Um, to find out when they are hosting in-person training sessions. And on our website, uh, we have a training calendar with all of the upcoming training events, both in-person and virtual. We host a monthly webinar series that we offer for groups of five and community sponsors. Um, and periodically, we will offer webinars on a variety of topics related to the private sponsorship program. And lastly, um, uh, we also um, we also help sponsors review their group of five or community sponsor applications before sponsors submit their application packages to IRCC. Um, we are not able to help with completing the forms, but we, are, we will be able to review your completed application forms and your packages um, to, uh, to see if, if, uh, if, they are, uh, if they are complete or if anything is missing. So do connect with your local RCP trainer if, you, if you'd like help with that. Um, so, in front of you right now, you see the agenda for today. And as you can see, there is a lot to learn. We will begin by explaining how to create a user account and how to sign in, followed by how to initiate an application and inviting group members and the principal applicants if desired. Um, we will take a look at the information needed for the principal applicant and each of the group members. And then we will show you the direct input online digital forms as well as how to uh, upload any required PDF forms, supporting documents, and additional forms needed for the private sponsorship application. We will conclude with the information about the principal applicant's declaration and what to do if the principal applicant does not have access to the portal. Um, we will take questions at the end, um, as we mentioned, so please type them in the chat, uh, in, the, in the questions box. Uh, please keep in mind that during the training sessions, we will not be answering any case-specific questions or going into detail about the application forms themselves. Um, we, we do offer specific webinars um, that you can register for uh, via our training calendar on our website that will explain um, the new forms and the changes to the applicable guides for groups of five, community sponsors, and sponsor agreement holders. So with that understanding, let's focus our attention now on the Permanent Residence Portal, or PR Portal, for submitting applications for the Private Sponsorship of Refugees Program. The permanent resident portal existed before, and in fact, it is used uh, for other immigration streams. Now, from November 1st, it has been expanded to include online submission of private sponsorship applications. There will be a grace period during the transition period from submitting applications by email to using the online submission portal only. The grace period will be until 31st December of this year, 2023. So the benefit of using the portal is that the application forms can be accessed, edited, and submitted directly online, and supporting documents will be uploaded directly into the portal. 
This digital intake method will also provide a stronger protection measure for the privacy of information being provided, and files will be created in the IRCC system much more efficiently so that PSR applications can be actioned sooner. Any sponsorship group type will be able to access the portal, whether they are a group of five, a community sponsor, a SA, or sponsorship agreement holder, their constituent groups, or their co-sponsors. Immigration representatives will also have access to private sponsor for refugees applications now. So let's take a look at how private sponsors can access the PR portal. To access the permanent residence portal, you can type in the web address in the browser URL field or simply type PR portal into Google search. Once the web page opens, you will see the title and the description for the portal. And below that, you will have the option to sign into your account here. And if you ever forget your password, you can reset it here. But if you don't already have an account, you have the option here to create a new user account. When you first create a user account, you will need to provide a working email address, which will be associated with your PR portal user account. For groups of five, you will need to provide a designated personal email address that you intend to use for communicating with IRCC. Be sure this is an email, an email address that you check um, regularly. And please note that once a PR portal user account has been created, you cannot change the email address associated with this user account. For community sponsorship groups, you may want to create a designated organizational email address that you will use for all communication with IRCC, which will also be associated with your organization's primary sponsor user account in the portal. So for example, if my organization's name was Lifeboat, then the email address to use for the primary sponsor could be sponsorships at lifeboat.org. Again, you cannot change the email address associated with this user account once it has been created. Whatever email you decide to use uh, for your PR portal user account, this should be the same email address that you use to send correspondence to IRCC if you ever need to contact them regarding an application that has been submitted via the portal. Next, you will need to choose a password that has a unique combination of letters, numbers, and characters. If your password doesn't meet any of the six parameters listed here, the missing requirement will not have a green check mark next to it. In this case, we do not have any specific characters in the password. Once you have entered the password that meets each of these requirements, click on the checkbox to indicate that you have read and accepted terms of use and privacy policy. Then simply click on the create account button. You can now expect to receive an email that contains a unique verification code. Check your spam folder if you do not see it in your inbox. You will need to enter the code into this field in order to complete the user account registration. And once you have entered the verification code, click on the complete registration button. If you have entered the code correctly, you will see a green confirmation box appear at the top of this page. Your user account creation is now complete, so you can now use the email address and password, which you had chosen during this account creation process, to log into the PR portal. To access the permanent resident portal, you can type the web address into the browser URL field, as you can see on, on the screen right now, or simply type PR portal into Google search to find the web address. Once the web page opens, you can sign into your account with the email and password associated with the account, and then click on the sign in button. When this page opens, you will know that you are signed into your account because at the top right side, you will see your email address displayed and an option to sign out. 
In order to submit applications to IRCC using the portal, one of the sponsorship group members must be designated as the primary sponsor. In a moment, we will discuss in detail how to decide who the primary sponsor should be. But for now, what you need to know is that this will be the person who will initiate the application. The key things to keep in mind when deciding who will be the primary sponsor is that they have specific responsibilities, such as they will be the only one who can invite or delete group members and submit the completed application to IRCC. Once the application has been initiated, the primary sponsor will add the names and email addresses to the application for each of the other members of the sponsorship group. They can also invite the refugee principal applicant, although this is completely optional, depending on whether the refugee applicant has access to reliable internet or not. And we will talk more about that in the next few slides. So once the group members have been invited, an automatic email invitation will be sent to each of them. Now let's take a closer look at how to decide who the primary sponsor should be. For a group of five, any one of the group members can be the primary sponsor. So whoever initiates the application first will have that responsibility. For a community sponsorship group, it will be a best practice to set up a single designated email address for the primary sponsor user account for initiating all of your applications. Immigration representatives, such as lawyers or consultants, may also initiate applications on behalf of their clients who are the sponsors. However, they must invite a sponsor to the application. The representative will have the ability to submit the application to IRCC. If sponsors want to have ultimate control of the application submission, then the sponsors should determine to be the primary sponsor and then simply invite their immigration representative to assist with completing the principal applicant's forms. Now let's take a look at what a primary sponsor's responsibilities would be. The primary sponsor initiates an application and has the option to invite the principal applicants. The primary sponsor invites or deletes members. Primary sponsor reviews forms for correctness, verifies uploaded documents, and submits applications. Primary sponsor can also see the status of all portal applications that are in progress, have been submitted or returned. They can also edit and delete unsubmitted applications in the portal. They can resend passwords to group members. They have the sole ability to download the submitted application package as a zip file. And with that capability, it is possible for them to view other group members' IDs and financial documents that have been uploaded into the portal. Now let's see who the primary sponsor will be inviting to the application. For groups of five, the primary sponsor would invite each of the other group members. For community sponsors, they could invite any co-sponsors. Now let's take a look at what invited group members can and cannot do. So invited group members can create a user account. They can see a listing of applications they have been invited to. They can view and edit the refugee forms. They can upload their personal ID documents and financial documents, and they can upload sponsors forms and supporting documents. What they cannot do, they can't invite or delete group members. They can't submit or delete applications. They can't view or edit applications they're not invited to, and they cannot access other group members' uploaded personal documents, such as ID documents or financial documents. So basically, the person who is designated as the primary sponsor should be comfortable with technology and should be able to manage all documents uploaded by all group members. But keep in mind that this person will also have access to very sensitive information on, on all of the other group members. So it is recommended that all group of five members discuss who will be designated as the primary sponsor for this application. Now let's take a look at how to initiate an application. You will need to scroll down to the page until you see this section here. 
The right side of the page can be disregarded since this function is intended for persons who are already in Canada and who need to apply for or renew or replace their permanent resident card or permanent resident travel documents. The left side of the page is where you have the choice to either start a new application or to view your existing applications. Just a reminder that only a primary sponsor will click on the Start New Application button, since they are the only ones who will initiate the application. For all other group members who have been invited to join an online application, you would select the View My Permanent Resident Applications button. Before we continue on to see how a primary sponsor will initiate a new application, let's take a quick look at an example of what the listing of permanent resident applications will look like after they have been created in the portal. As you can see, we have several applications listed in this example, and you should be aware of a few things when accessing your own listing of applications. If you are the primary sponsor, you will see a listing of all applications you have initiated, as well as any other applications that you have been invited to that are based on the email address associated with your particular portal user account. So what this means for sponsorship groups who undertake several applications each year, you may want to use just one primary sponsor user account if it is important for you to keep track of all of your application submissions in one place. If you are a group member who has been invited to a single application, then you would only see that one application in your listing. However, if you have been invited to multiple applications, then you would see all of the applications you have been invited to as long as you use the same email address for each application. If you had provided a different email address for some of the applications that you were invited to, and you had created a different portal user account for each one, then you would not see all of those applications in one place. Let's take a look at the type of information that portal users can expect to see in their listing of applications. The first column is where you will see the application name. This is a specific title which is chosen when an application is initiated. It will not be used for any other reason then to help you locate a particular application from within the listing. Choose a name for the application that will work best, one that will help you to easily identify a particular application. A simple naming convention you may wish to use is to start with the family name of the principal applicant in all capital letters, followed by their given name and their date of birth. For community sponsorship groups who work with co-sponsors, you may want to include the name of the co-sponsor as well. In the second column, you will see the program identifier, which in the case of PSR applicants, it will always show as refugee. If, however, you had used your PR portal user account to create a family class application, this would also show up in your listing of applications with the category of family displayed. The category column will show you which type of application it is, group of five or community sponsored. The next column will show the date that a completed application was submitted and the status column will show you the progress of an application within the portal. So for example, an application that has been initiated and is still being edited will show as yellow in progress bar. And uh, the application that has been submitted to IRCC will appear as green submitted bar. An application which have been returned will have a red returned bar showing. And under the actions column, you will click on the view button to open the application. And next to that, you will see the delete button. Now, if you're a primary sponsor, when you select delete, it deletes everything for that application. If you are an invited group member, you cannot delete the application. If you want to be removed from the application, then the primary sponsor will need to do that. Now let's go back to the homepage to see how a primary sponsor will initiate an application. Again, just a reminder that only a primary sponsor will click on the start new application button since they alone have the designated responsibility to initiate an application. So to start a new application, the primary sponsor could click 
the menu option at the top of the page here to start a new application. Or they could scroll down to this section of the home page and click the start new application button here. Before the application can be generated by the system, you must identify the type of application you wish to create. Remember that this portal is used for several immigration streams, so we have to identify that this is an application for private sponsorship and which type of a sponsorship group so that the correct application forms are generated by the system. So click on the first drop-down box arrow and select Refugee. Then click on the next drop-down box arrow and select the Private Sponsorship of Refugees program. Next, you will need to choose your group type. For this demonstration, we will select Group of Five. Then enter in the application title name. Remember, this is what will show up on your listing of applications. So choose a name that can be easily identified because you cannot change this name after the application has been created. Finally, click on the Continue button. Here is where you will enter your name as the primary sponsor. Remember, any one of the group of five members can be designated to be primary sponsor. It would be beneficial if you choose the person from the group who is comfortable with, with using technology, using computers, and is comfortable with also reviewing all of the forms and documents before submitting them. When completing these online forms, whenever you see a red asterisk, this means you must provide a response. These are mandatory fields. Enter in your family name and then your given name. When you click on the continue button, you should see a success notification pop up letting you know that the application has been created. At this point, you could log out of the portal if you wanted to and resume working on it at another time. To access the listing of your application, simply select view my applications from the menu item here. As you can see, the application is now visible here in the listing. To resume working on it again, you simply click on the View button here, and that's how you will be able to open the application and continue working on it. With that, I'm going to now give the floor to my colleague, Serena, to walk us through the rest of the uh, functions. Thank you, Ekaterina. Okay, so after the application has been initiated, you'll be directed to the principal applicant's profile page. Alternatively, you may wish to invite other group members to this application first, if you do not yet have the refugees information. Simply click on the menu item here to open the group member page. For groups of five, there will be a notification symbol displayed, like this one, when there are still group members who have not yet been invited. In this case, we'll go ahead and enter in the information required for the principal applicant, such as the preferred language of correspondence, as well as their full name and date of birth. Next will be the mailing address information and an option to select whether or not their residential address is the same as their mailing address. If it is not, you would need to insert information for the current place they are residing. Next, you would click on the button to add a dependent of the principal applicant if it's applicable. An input box will open up for you to complete. And once you've entered in the information, the Save Details button will become active. Then you will click on it to save the information. And you can now see that a dependent has been added. You can also go back and edit the information if needed. Or you can delete the added dependent. Or you could go on to add another dependent if you wish, or come back to add more dependents at a later time. When you are finished, click the Save and Continue button. Now let's take a look at how to invite people to the application. Remember, the primary sponsor is the only one who can add the other signatories to the application. So for a group of five, the primary sponsor must invite a minimum of four more group members. If you're a community sponsor and you're working with a co-sponsor, you can invite them as a group member here. Remember, when you add a person as a group member, they can fill out the forms, and upload documents, but they do not have the ability to submit the application. 
only the primary sponsor has this ability. Click on the Invite Additional Sponsor button, and this will open up the section where you will insert their information. Then click on the Send Invite button. Doing so will send an automated email to the person you have invited to the application. They must then follow the unique link in the email sent to them and log into the portal using the same email address that the invitation was sent to and to use the temporary password that is provided in that email as well. Now you can see that the person we have invited is included here. Each invited person's information will appear as separate blocks of information. For groups of five, there will be a warning message like this when there are not four or more additional group members invited. So once you have invited at least four other members, this warning message will disappear. If you need to remove a group member, it can be done here, but only before the application has been submitted. After submission, you would need to contact IRCC if a group member needs to be replaced. And just a reminder, only the primary sponsor can remove group members from the application. And the primary sponsor also has the ability to resend a temporary password to an invited member if they did not open the email they had received within 30 days of being invited. The temporary password expires after 30 days. Invited members will only be able to click on the More Details button for their own block of information. They cannot access the protected details for other group members. This protected section is where any documents which contain sensitive information are to be uploaded. Only the invited person and the primary sponsor will be able to access and view documents which have been uploaded here. As you can see, for an invited group member, there are several documents to be uploaded in this section. Sponsors must closely follow the IMM 2200 guide for groups of five or the IMM 2201 guide if you are a community sponsor to ensure that the correct required documents are uploaded here. Even if a particular item listed does not have a red asterisk within the portal. All group members will need to upload as a minimum their sponsor assessment, proof of status, and police check. Simply click on the upload button next to an identified item in this listing that you're going to provide a document for. There are other items that may need to be uploaded here, but which do not have a red asterisk next to the item name. So for example, for an invited group member that is contributing funds from their personal source of income, a financial profile will need to be uploaded. The same goes for uploading the CRA Notice of Assessment document. Each person providing funds from their personal income will need to upload the Notice of Assessment document under the Proof of Fund category here. Yet for group members who are not providing funds for the sponsorship, they do not have to upload a financial profile or provide proof of funds for their personal income. When it comes to uploading the proof of funds such as bank statements or funds held in trust, details of deposits, signed stamp letters from the bank, or statements from fundraising activities, et cetera, IRCC requests that these documents be uploaded by the primary sponsor under the other option for uploading. And for each uploaded document, wherever it's uploaded in this portal, there is a specific naming convention that should be used. And there are other file preparation requirements that you will need to follow before uploading documents to the portal. And we'll take a look at those naming conventions in the next slide. So the uh, required file preparation that you will need to do includes particular file types and file size, file naming, and acceptable characters to use when naming those files. So the type of files that are accepted are PDF files, or image files such as JPEG, JPEG, or PNG, or document files 
such as doc or docx. The maximum size a file can be is four megabytes. And there will be a warning message in the portal if your file size is actually too big. If you need to reduce a particular document's file size, you can use a free online website called ilovepdf.com or a similar online tool. When uploading images, the smallest resolution size should be 420 by 540 pixels. And for file naming, you must include the last name of the individual followed by a dash, and then the first name followed by a dash, and then the document type that it is, followed by a dash. And then you would add an item number if you're uploading multiple files using the same document type name. And Rocco, the Resettlement Operations Center in Ottawa, has confirmed, however, that they would prefer PDFs where multiple files are merged into one document rather than uploading separate PDF files for the same document type. And we'll explain this further in the next slide. The allowable characters that can be used when typing your file name are upper and lowercase letters, numbers, dashes, underscores, or a dot. So for francophones, this is particularly important because you cannot use French keyboard letters that have accents, even when it is for a person's name. So we're gonna take a look at a case example so you can understand better how to create your file naming for the documents you're going to upload. And so it's going to be based on this particular pr principal applicant, their spouse and child and sponsors. So for example, if the principal applicant has some documents to include for proof of education, such as a diploma and a certificate. These documents could be saved as separate files and using file names that are exactly the same, except that they include a sequential number at the end. Or if you're able to merge these documents into one PDF file that is less than four megabytes in size, then Rocco would prefer that. When uploading photos for this family, each photo can be uploaded separately, where the file name must include the name of the person in that photo. So for example, this is how each of the photo files would be named for this principal applicant, their spouse, and their dependent child. However, again, if you prefer, you may merge all of the photos into one PDF file that is less than four megabytes and simply use the principal applicant's name along with the file name photos. When it comes to file naming for specific forms and other supporting documents, be sure you are using the appropriate names based on the document being uploaded. So for the principal applicant schedule two, you would include the name of the PA and the title of the form, which is of course, schedule two. The same goes for the RSD document, the refugee status determination document. You would use the principal applicant's name and include RSD for the title. And the same goes for the principal applicant's declaration. And you'll learn more about the declaration page in later slides. If you're uploading the undertaking document, you can use the principal applicant's name followed by undertaking as shown in the example here. When you're uploading specific forms or documents for individual sponsors, you must include the individual sponsor's name as well as what the document type is. For example, the financial profiles would be named according to the sponsor it belongs to, as in this example here. And the same goes for the sponsor assessment forms or for any ID documents for proving a sponsor's Canadian status. Once you've invited the group members, if you scroll down the page, you have the option to invite the principal applicant. And you can also invite a representative for the principal applicant. Of course, if the refugee doesn't have sufficient language skills or internet access, you do not have to invite them to the online application in the portal. Sponsors can select no here 
but they will need to upload a PDF version of the refugees digitally signed declaration form. And you'll learn more about that again in some upcoming slides. When you invite an immigration representative who will act on behalf of the principal applicant with IRCC, you will fill in their name and email address and you are required to identify whether they are a registered representative or not. Registered representatives are paid representatives, such as an immigration lawyer or licensed consultant. If the intended representative is not registered, they are considered to be unpaid representatives. Regardless of being paid or unpaid representatives, they will need to upload the use of representative form, which authorizes them to act on behalf of the principal applicant. Keep in mind that once a representative has been invited, they cannot be removed from the application. You will need to contact IRCC by email external to the portal if there will be a change to the representative. When you select the no option here, meaning that the representative is not being paid to act on the principal applicant's behalf with IRCC, such as a family member in Canada who's not a party to the sponsorship, then that person would be sent an invitation to create a user account in the PR portal. They would then have the same level of permissions to access the online application as the principal applicant would have had. So this means that the rep can edit and view the refugee forms, and they can also upload supporting documents and forms on behalf of the refugee. If you select yes, that the representative is registered, then this paid representative will be sent an invitation with a link to sign in to the immigration representatives portal to access the principal applicant's online application. When the paid representative first creates their user account, for the immigration rep portal, they will need to provide their membership ID, the name of their firm or company, as well as the governing body. Once they have signed in, they can edit and view the refugees application forms, and they can also upload supporting documents and additional forms on behalf of the principal applicant. Next, we're going to take a look at how to access the application forms and where to upload the sponsorship documents. The primary sponsor, as well as any other invited persons, can access the application to complete the online forms and upload any required documents. To access this page, you would click on the application menu item here at the top right. On the left side, you will see the quick navigation menu for this particular web page. These are simply quick links to jump to a particular section of this page. If this is your first time viewing the page, however, please do take the time to scroll down manually and read the information provided for you. In particular, you will want to scroll to the before you start section where there are links for you to access the relevant guides and checklists which you will need to refer to when completing the application forms. As you can see in these instructions, you will not need to select and complete every single form that is available within this page. As we mentioned earlier, this portal is used by other immigration streams. And so not all of the forms are going to be used for private sponsorship of refugee application submissions. This is why it's very important to follow the guides and document checklist, which are linked here, to ensure you are including the correct items. Now let's click on this quick menu button to jump to the IMM008 section. In this section of the page, you can see that the generic application form falls under the heading Digital Forms for Groups of Five. If you are a community sponsor, it will display digital forms for community sponsors. In this initial release of the permanent residence portal, only the principal applicant's generic application and Schedule A are available to complete online from within the portal. Below this section, you will see the PDF form section. 
which contains the required undertaking form for your particular sponsorship group, as well as the Refugees Schedule II form. The sponsors forms and Schedule II can be downloaded from the provided links below the form number. These forms are to be completed offline, meaning you do not need to be logged into the portal to complete them. When these PDF forms have been completed and signed, and the file has been saved according to the correct size and naming convention, simply click on this button to upload the undertaking form and click here to upload the principal applicant schedule too. If there are any dependents over 18, you will need to click this button again to upload their schedule twos as well. Now let's take a look at the online version of the generic application. You will first see some information to read before proceeding to the form. Be sure to click on the link for the instruction guide, which will guide you in how to complete this form. You should also have copies of supporting documents for the refugee family, for example, passports or national identity documents, or the RSD document, because you will need to fill in their personal information based on those documents. Then click on the Continue button. On the left side is a new menu tree, which will show you which section of the online generic application you are on. You will not be able to navigate to the next section until all of the required fields have been entered and saved. In this particular section of the form, you'll notice that the online version does not indicate that this particular question is a required field. This does not mean you can leave it blank. Remember, the generic application form is used by several other immigration streams and some of them do not have to complete this field. But for privately sponsored refugee applicants, it must be filled out or it will be returned by IRCC. You should always follow the guide when completing this form so you won't omit any fields that are required for private sponsor refugee applications. When you have entered in any fields with the red asterisk, you can click on the Save and Continue button to proceed. You can certainly go back in again at a later time to fill in the remaining fields that are necessary for PSR applications. And once you have navigated through each of these sections and completed all of the fields with the red asterisk, you will see a green check mark next to each menu item. Again, this does not mean that you have filled in all of the required information within each of these sections. It simply means that the fields with the red asterisk have been entered and saved. When you get to the dependents section, it's important to read the information displayed here. In particular, you will need to click on the link here to open the principal applicant's profile page if you have not yet added their spouse or partner or dependents to the application. You must do this first before moving on to complete the personal details for each dependent, which will be listed here after they have been added to the principal applicant's profile page. Once you've completed all of the personal details for each dependent, a completed status will be displayed. And then the button here will become visible for you to click on which will take you back to the main navigation page for the application. And you'll now see a green check mark next to the IMM0008 menu item. Keep in mind, again, this is not an indication that you've filled in all of the necessary information for your PSR application. It is only an indication that the fields with the red asterisk have been completed for the generic application. Now let's take a look at the additional application form section. You have the option to search for and add additional forms here, but most of the forms in this drop-down list are for other immigration streams. The ones which are relevant to the Private Sponsorship of Refugees Program applicants are the optional forms, such as the use of representative, 
and the appointment of a representative in the community of settlement. There's also a parental consent declaration form that could be used in cases where the principal applicant is divorced and wants to bring their child to live in Canada. Let's move on to the supporting documents section now. This is a group of five application. The two documents that have to be uploaded here are the photos and refugee status determination document. For community sponsors, these two documents will also be listed here. The refugee applicants may have additional supporting documentation to include with the application. You can search for the document type here. And if you want to quickly locate a particular title, you can type the first letter of the title in the search field. I have pre-populated this application with the various document titles that may be used for the principal applicant's additional supporting documents for the private sponsorship of refugees program. As I scroll down, you can see that there are quite a few that you can choose from. When searching through the available document titles within this drop-down list, Please be aware that many of the options available are only to be used for other immigration streams. In particular, you should not use the title option called Translations and Affidavit. Instead, you are expected to include the translation in the same PDF file as the original document. So for example, if the principal applicant has a police check to upload, you would select the title option called Police Report, then upload a PDF document that includes both the police report and the translation together in that one file. The file naming convention for this PDF document would need to have the principal applicant's family name, a dash, the PA's given name, and another dash, followed by the title, Police Report. Now let's go to the last section, the principal applicant's declaration. If the principal applicant was not invited to the application previously, you will need to download a PDF version of the consents and declarations form for the principal applicant to sign. If you do not see this link here to download the form, and the upload button appears to be grayed out, this is a good indication that you left the toggle option on yes instead of no within the group members page. Click here to access manage group members page. Toggle mm -hmm. this option to no. Then when you go back to the application, you should see the link to download the form and the upload button will then become active. If however, you had opted to invite the PA. When you return to the declaration section, there will be a view button for the primary sponsor to check to see if the principal applicant's electronic signature has been completed. Keep in mind that only the refugee can complete and electronically sign their declaration. Sponsors or immigration representatives cannot sign on behalf of the principal applicant. When the refugee logs into their account, they will see a start button to access their consents and declaration form. When this online version of the form opens, the principal applicant will read the information here and then click on their preferred response options to these questions. Then they will need to scroll down and continue to read all of the information in this declaration so they understand what they are agreeing to. And in order to give their consent, they will need to electronically sign the declaration page by typing in their full name into the field here. Then they would scroll down where they will see the blue button that is now active, which they can click on to continue. After the refugee declaration is finished, you can scroll down to see where the application submission button is located. As you can see, the button is grayed out because we haven't yet finished everything that needs to be done for this application. Below the button, you can see warning messages which will indicate what the sponsors need to complete before the application can be submitted. Note that the button may also be grayed out if you are not the primary sponsor. 
Remember that only the primary sponsor or a paid immigration rep for the sponsors may submit completed applications. Before they do so, the primary sponsor or the uh, paid representative for the sponsors will need to review the whole application to ensure nothing is missing, paying particular attention to ensure that all required information has been included in the online digital forms, as well as reviewing all of the uploaded forms and documents to verify that the application is complete. PSR applicants can disregard the point that is listed here to include proof you paid your fees. This is actually a reminder for other immigration streams. Privately sponsored refugee applications do not have a fee. Once every warning message has been addressed, the confirm and submit button will become active for the primary sponsor. And if the primary sponsor is satisfied that everything is in order, they can click the button to submit the application to IRCC. Once an application has been submitted, it can no longer be edited within the portal. An exception to this, however, will occur when IRCC finds that the application is incomplete. In this case, the Resettlement Operations Center in Ottawa will send an email externally to the primary sponsor with an explanation of what is missing. The application will become unlocked again in the portal, but only for the primary sponsor to make the necessary corrections. The principal applicant will need to resign their declaration if the changes required are related to their portion of the application. Keep in mind that there is no longer going to be a fixed period of time by which you will need to resubmit the application via the portal if it was returned. This is because the processing time will not begin until a complete application is received by Rocco. So if the sponsor waits 30 days to resubmit the corrected application, then the processing date timestamp for placing the application in the queue for processing, so first in and first out, will not be until that later timeframe. The application submission date will be according to the most recent submitted application. It will not be backtracked to the date that you originally submitted that application. Now let's take a look at when you can expect to receive an automated email. The permanent residence portal will send out automated emails following certain user actions. The first auto email will be sent out to the primary sponsor who initiates an application. They will be the only one to receive this notification informing them that the application has been started in the portal. If the principal applicant has been invited to the online application, then they will receive an email notification with a unique link inviting them to log into the portal. The same goes for other sponsorship group members. They will each receive an automated email with a unique link to log into the portal. If there is an immigration rep for the principal applicant, so for example, an unpaid representative, they will also need to be invited and will need an email notification with a unique link to log in to the portal. If, however, it is a paid immigration rep who has initiated the application as a representative of the sponsorship group, then they are required to invite the primary sponsor when they initiate the application so that the sponsor will get an invitation notifying them that they've been added to the application. In this case, the primary sponsor has the option to access the portal to view and edit the application, but this is not necessary, however. The principal applicant may just want to leave it up to their paid representative to solely access the portal to complete the application on their behalf. The key reason the sponsor is being invited to the application is so they will receive the auto email notifications from the portal. When a group member is removed, 
the primary sponsor or paid representative for the group, and all invited persons are notified. When an application has been submitted, the primary sponsor or paid rep for the group and all invited persons are notified. When an application is returned, however, only the primary sponsor or paid representative for the sponsorship group will be notified. This is because they will need to ensure that the declaration is signed again once the issue has been rectified. And please note that once the application has been screened by an officer and is deemed complete, an acknowledgement of receipt email notification will be sent external from the portal. It will come from the Resettlement Operations Center in Ottawa and will include the G number. All other correspondence after this point will be done external to the portal. So this means that the process for sending or receiving updates on the application will remain the same as before the portal was launched. So what cannot be submitted through the permanent residence portal? One-year window applications. You will submit these via email as per the current process. And blended visa office referred applications. You will submit these via email as per the current process as well. Joint assistance sponsorship applications. Sponsorship agreement holders will submit these via email as per the current process. And when a new dependent needs to be added after the application has been submitted to IRCC, you will need to email IRCC external from the portal. And for any other updates on the sponsorship, sponsors should follow the current process, which is to submit changes via the IRCC web form. Now we're gonna go through a few frequently asked questions and so these questions may have come to mind regarding this new online portal submission method. You may be wondering, how do I access the portal? What equipment do I need? So any computer, tablet, or mobile device can be used. You just need an internet connection and a web browser, such as Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Mozilla Firefox, or Apple Safari. This is the web address for the digital portal. You also may be wondering how sponsors will submit applications if they don't have the technical knowledge or skills to even be able to use a computer. Well, IRCC does recognize that the PR portal may present an accessibility barrier for some clients. So applications submitted by mail will still be accepted. Keep in mind, however, mailed applications will take longer because they still need to be digitized. And where would you get information or help for using the online portal? Well, each of the current guides to the private sponsorship will be updated to include instructions for submitting applications online. And you can also request help through the IRCC web form. RSTP has a walkthrough training webinars, which you can register for. But we will also, as we mentioned, be posting demonstration videos on YouTube, which will address frequently asked questions about using the portal and how to create a user account, how to log in, et cetera. And we will also have a list of frequently asked questions posted on the RSTP website. So that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. I'm um, wishing everybody a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.